We are very lucky to have two distinguished guests with us today. Dr. Greg Grandin is the author of a number of prize-winning books, including most recently, The Empire of Necessity, Slavery, Freedom, and Deception in the New World, which won the Bancroft Prize in American History and was shortlisted for the Samuel Johnson Prize in the UK. Currently a professor at AU, but soon to be joining the faculty at Yale, he's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and he has served as a consultant to the United Nations Truth Commission on Guatemala. Dr. Grandin is here today to, disc to discuss his newest book, The End of Myth, From the Frontier to the Border Wall in the Mind of America. Called A Vital Corrective to Popular Conceptions by the New Yorker, End of Myth is a sweeping expo exploration of the meaning of the frontier throughout U.S. history from the American Revolution to the presidential elections of 2016. Dr. Grandin will be in conversation today with Ms. Dara Lind, a senior co correspondent for Vox, covering mainly immigration and immigration policy. She's received recognition for her work from John Jay College's Center for Media, Crime, and Justice, and by the nonprofit immigration organization, Define American. We are obviously very excited to have them here with us today, so please help me give a warm welcome to Dr. Greg Grandin and Dara Lind. Good afternoon. Thanks for coming inside on one of the, the, the third of five nice days we're going to get in DC this year. And thanks so much to Politics and Prose for hosting us and for Dr. Grandin for coming down from New York for the weekend. Uh, you know, it seems a little bit basic, only slightly less basic than the Webster's Dictionary defines to, to start off with the title of the book, but you luckily have given us a title that is very evocative, but you don't, but that isn't, you know, so literal that it can be easily defined. So can I just start off by asking you, what is the myth? The, the myth is, um, is the frontier and and all the frontier symbolizes in in um u.s identity it's it's one of the most resonant symbols of what might be called american exceptionalism and it captures an idea that is um or a prerogative of the united states that really is unique and exceptional to the united states it's hard to think of another nation particularly a nation that self-identifies as anti-colonial and we could talk about you know the ways in which anti-colonialism can mean its opposite in the history of the united states but um but an, a nation that understood itself as republican uh not imperial um uh, uh, and the frontier i can think of no other nation that so long had the prerogative of using the promise of expansion and the experience of expansion to organize domestic politics. And so the, the frontier is, is coined, it's a, it's, a, it's a symbol that becomes commonplace in American political discourse in the late 1900s, um, uh, in, in the late 1800s, I'm sorry, with, um, with Frederick Jackson Turner, an historian who gives a who presents a paper, The Significance of the Frontier in American History, in, in 1893 at the Chicago War World Fair. It's the World Fair that in which um, you might know as, as uh, the one stalked by that serial killer made famous by Eric Lawson. Uh, and, uh, and, Turner, and Turner's argument was, um, it was revolutionary. It turned U.S. historiography on its head and, and said, unlike previous historians who said that everything good came out of Europe, uh, uh, fully formed. Turner said everything good about the United States, its, its unique form of uh, individualism, its deep commitment to political democracy, uh, a kind of curious pragmatism, was all formed in the New World and on the frontier. And, and from that moment onward, the frontier became kind of deep symbol of American nationalism. And the point of the book is uh, I got the idea for the book pretty much on the day that Donald Trump announced for the presidency, when he descended on the elevator down into the lobby of, of Trump Towers and he announced that he was going to build uh, a great, great wall separating the United States from, from Mexico. And it struck me that, that the opposition between the idea of a frontier, frontier which symbolizes limitlessness, boundedlessness, even deathlessness, a certain kind of a, a frontier that could be projected out into infinity, a frontier whose theorists said that um, that that uh, that uh, that it was the place where the United States moved into the future and moved into the world. It became more liberal, more internationalist, more multilateral. In contrast with the front, with the wall, 
uh, uh, you know, which symbolizes and the, all of the border and nativist politics that went along with the ball, uh, the wall, kind of turning inward, uh, being captured in, in, in layers and layers of past racial grievances, an idea that politics shouldn't be organized through endless growth, but through a sense that the frontier is closed and we have to, and we have to take care of our own, a whole set of ideas that gathered around Trumpism that came to be called race realism, uh, and, and the way the wall captured that in very graphic terms. So it seemed to me that there was a story to be told, that the fundamental Sim symbology or mythology of American history had had inverted from the frontier to the wall, and that's the, and that's the nature of the book. I, Dara wrote something on Twitter. She she talked about uh, 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 you know wanting to know how a, a nation that its slogan was to go west now is uh, we're full up or something. Right. Like I that. mean, <laughs> I do have to ask. Did do you have sources in the administration that like so you decided that when you were rolling out this book you were going to get the president to start saying we're yeah. full which is an even more explicit yeah, we're, rejection of we're the frontier ethos in, yeah we're working in tandem no no <laughs> no it's just a, I, you know it's just a you know the, the the state of emergency the you know it's it's created a bit of a panic on my part because the book is the book is historical it starts in the 18th century. It starts at the beginning of, of, of Anglo colonization in North America um, and works its way through in some in, in, with some detail before we get to the present. But the but the argument of of the way its argument is that the that there's been a nationalization of border brutalism. You know uh, that there's been a borderfication of national politics. That that's what Trump represents. It seems to, I mean, on a daily basis, we seem to be reading confirmations of that, and we could talk about it. We could relate the argument to the, to the, to the, to the, to the, to current events. But another way of thinking about it is that you know, we used to say go west, now we say go away. <laughs> right? That's, well, that's the, cute. That's better. Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> um, but but right. So, what you're talking about implicitly in there is understanding America as. You know, the, the idea of deathlessness, which comes up often in the book as an expression of like eternal youth, that the frontier is where America will, you know, that there, it will discover new energies. There will always be, you know, there, the, the motif of expanding the sphere comes up a lot as a way for America to renew its energies. And it's almost as if America has spent most of its time trying to escape history, right? You know, the idea that it is that unlike Europe in, you know, in early American comparisons, the idea was that Europe was hidebound by, you know, hundreds of years of rivalries and that America was going to escape all of that entirely. And it seems that at some point history has caught up with us, right? It kind of, that's the the turn to a more, you know, as you say, like this, this race realist, this acknowledgement that you can't, not everyone can continue to improve their lives forever, but the effort to turn that into a boundedness of, you know, and so therefore white people have to protect what's theirs. When when did the myth end? When did history catch up with the U.S.? Well, yes, it, I'll, I'll answer that question. But, let me, you know, so there is a way in which the frontier was understood as, a, as the fountain of youth, a, a venue of perpetual renewal and rejuvenation, a, a place where, where the U.S. could escape the bloody obligations, whether it be of Europe, whether it be of the Civil War, and rather than deal concretely with the obligations that the, that the freeing of millions of, of enslaved people entailed and and placed on the state and you know there's a way in which constant moving west was a way of 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 shaking off obligations and it was the foundation of a of the maintenance of a notion of freedom an ideal of freedom as freedom from restraint there are other ways of thinking about freedom and there are other th ways of thinking about political rights right we think about pol uh, you know in the united states they fetishize a, a, a certain kind of individual right, right, in which in which individuals have a right to hold and possess and to own and to and to believe and to assemble. And that that under that posits a state that is very restrained from its own right, that creates a, a safe space in which individuals can pursue their interests. Every other nation in the world ha, ha, has has a more social understanding of rights that, in, that entails a more active state. That 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 brings about healthcare, that that right to healthcare, right to education, a right to a decent life. Those are two different conceptions of rights, and they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. But in the United States, the United States has fetishized and sanct 
and sanctified one and vilified and, and, and understood another one as perverse. And the argument is that this is only through constant, constant moving west. The constant, you know, and then when the landed frontier is over through expansion, through more, metaf- more metaphorical realms of the market or more missionary per, uh, 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 adventures through, through warfare in the name of democracy to bring about a better world and all of that. To, just to circle back to Dara's question, when did it all end? It ends at different points. There's different moments when limits are reached and, and new ethics of social citizenship. The New Deal, for instance, is, is a perfect example. Uh, and I, I go into it. The, the Civil War is another moment where the United States might have turned inward and, and confronted honestly the social problems of, of democracy and, and, and freedom and equality and what they meant. But, um, but at each time, at each, at each moment where there was a sense that, that the United States was about to turn inward, there was always, there was always once again a, a, a fleeing forward and escaping the bounds, you know, Reaganism and all of the, what the new right represented was, a, you know, took as the New Deal coalition was collapsing, Reagan restored the mission. Uh, restored the sanctity of an unrestrained market, restored the notion of a military power that that is moral and and righteous and 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 is and is projected to bring good in the world, and all of these things help. They both help. Answer, the argument is that they both help organize domestic politics, the promise of unlimited growth, but also the what missionary wars help roll over the trauma and extremism generated in the last war into the next war. So where did it end? In the book, for the purpose of this argument, I, it's Iraq. It's the exhaustion of the neoliberal growth model. And it's hovering over all of this thing is cl- climate change. The, it, 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 political coalitions, ascendant politicians can no longer look to beyond, beyond the frontier and say, there, that's where our problems are going to be resolved. They can no longer invoke the promise of endless growth as a way to imagine a, 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 a distribution of benefits and, and, and answering social problems. They can no longer vent the extremism and violence and trauma that, that, are, that, that, that took place in the last war in Iraq, for instance, in Afghanistan, in the next war. The mission is desanctified. So I think that all, I think those three coordinates more than anything else help explain Trumpism. Let me just, I know I've been going on, but let me just say, so as Trump was emerging, there were two different explanations for Trump, diametrically opposed. One, he represented something completely alien to the US experience, a complete rupture and violation of a long but fitful history of proceduralism, tolerance, expansion of liberalism, institutionalism. And another more critical explanation said that he was the fulfillment of a, of, of, of a settled colonial violence that was always present in the US that has now just come to fruition. I, I don't think either of those explanations actually work unless you factor in the reality of expansion, the, the role expansion has played over the course of, of U.S. history, and, and, and the end of expansion. So the argument is Trumpism is what happens when the empire ends, when the frontier closes, when the extremism and the contradictions that had long been vented out would now whip around the homeland. There's, I mean, without, I don't know, I don't really know the ethics of spoiling a book that you guys are here to hear talk about. Um, I would say that the one of the wonderful things that you have in the book are kind of moments where uh, is essentially prophets understand exactly what's going to happen from John Quincy Adams after his presidency to Martin Luther King in, you know, confronting the Vietnam War, talking about how inevitably feeding a national myth with blood is going to create this, you know, once there's nowhere left to turn, it's going to create this kind of whipping around. But that brings me to the role of the military in this book as a social institution, which I think is really one of the interesting things here is in, it's not just about the rhetoric of moving elsewhere. It's about actually putting people in, you know, in that role of bringing democracy and also fomenting violence. And the, there's a very, I mean, 
I would say this is an unflinching attitude toward violence in the book. There's one moment where you're talking about border brutality and you say that it's difficult to contemplate. And I'm like, oh, you were totally cool with, you know, Andrew Jackson's men cutting off strips of skin to use as reins, but like the Yaleras are what's getting you. Um, but there's the military isn't just it, it's 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 presented as a social institution that, you know, both for both kind of the disaffected young men for ex-Confederates, for African-Americans is something that can reintegrate them into national life. And I was hoping you could talk more yeah. about that. So that ha that process happens on multiple levels. Um, you know, uh, before I get to it, let me just bracket and come back to what how you opened the question. I, I do want to just emphasize the, the John Quincy Adams, Martin Luther King. It's one of the things that I'm in some ways most proudest about or, or, or um, I, I, the John Quincy Adams, after he was voted out of office in 1820, um, uh, in the 1820s by Andrew Jackson, one term, John Quincy Adams represents the end of the coastal coalition and, and Jackson signals the, the coming to power of the frontier coalition. Uh, you know, uh, Quincy Adams, then he becomes a, a member of the House and, he's, and he spends the rest of his life becoming increasingly radicalized about the Jacksonian coalition. And he gives a speech in 1936 that is, is 1836, that is um, among the most damning anti-war speeches you will ever read. And what I try to do in the book is link that cycle of history from 1836 to Martin Luther King's um, uh, 1967 anti-Vietnam War speech and the way that breaks with the democratic establishment. That's a through line through the book. But to get back to the, um, we could talk about that more later, but to get back to Dara's question about the military. So there's a, there's a larger conceptual argument behind this. So James Madison in Federalist Number 10 puts forward a number of founding fathers explicitly make the argument that the way you solve problems endemic inherent to republicanism is through expansion and this is and this flips older republican theory on its head that that understood republics had to be maintained in a small space to maintain virtue uh madison said that um that the way you you deal with uh, political extremism and the way that you avoid, I mean, he wouldn't use the word class conflict, but he was talking about class conflict. He was talking about concentration of wealth and demands to break up concentration of wealth, sectors of the population that were deeply in debt and make, make demands to redistribute property. Madison says the way that you do this is, is, is by extending the sphere. And, you, and, you, and, and by constant expansion of the sphere, you break up, you break up factionalism. And you dilute extremism, and this is one. I mean, other other Republican theorists also theorized the importance of expansion to the maintenance of Republican virtue, but I'm focusing on Madison because theoretically that sounds good, right? You expand, expand the sphere, you bring, you allow diversity. This is also a foundation. It's also a foundational thought for thinking in a good way, not in a critical way of what neoliberals would call diversity, you know, that everybody is diverse, everybody has a multiple, there's a mul multiplicity of interests that we can't, that we can't identify that, that, you know, so everybody gets to do their own thing. It really is the foundation of a lot of kind of the, the awe celebration, modern celebration of diversity that you can find in Madison. So it's a good thing. But practically, what it means to extend the sphere is not an abstraction. It, it, it means violence. It means constant. The frontier is always also the border. And, and the process of moving west was a process of extreme brutality and unimaginable sorrow and unfathomable uh, 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 misery and, and, and destruction of families and lives and property, both Native Americans, the conquest of Mexico, uh, the expansion of chattel slavery. So there was a way in which that early Republican abstraction that understood expansion as as necessarily as as a precondition for freedom becomes understood as expansion is freedom, and 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 then it moves to the agent, the engine of expansion is freedom. The military becomes essential, and it becomes essential in so many ways. One, the military, in a, in a in a in a nation that lacks a social rights tradition, uh, the military is really the only social institution through, through which social mobility actually takes place. Poor blacks after 1898, 
poor whites. It, it, we, we don't have a, a, a social and economic bill of rights after World War II. We have a GI bill of rights. So it's through the military that, um, that, that, uh, that, uh, that a good chunk of the population gets housing, gets education, uh, has access to social mobility um, and, 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 and health care. Um, it's the military that, that – um, the military in many ways becomes, uh, becomes a very contradictory and con – contradictory ridden institution. But then, of course, it's also put to war. And war itself is the, 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 the ideology is involved in war, the way war deepens racism and extremism, particularly wars in the Philippines or war in the in the Caribbean. Um, uh, the, the way Mexican that war. the what or the Mexican or the Mexican War, the Mexican American War, which you know extends the United States and 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 the violence involved uh, against Mexican Americans, the way it deepens racism, um, the way that war allows for a the War of eighteen ninety eight allows for a reconciliation of the North and South. Uh, the conquest of Cuba, Puerto Rico, and, and the Philippines really was a way that the Confederate, the sons of the Confederacy allow, had, it was their ticket to readmission into the military structure. And that pact lasts until Vietnam. It falls apart in Vietnam. So there's ways in which the military is contradiction, is ridden with contradictions. It is both the, the institution through which progress and and liberalism, in some ways, is uh, is advanced, but it's also uh, the institution in which it's undermined, and that's the larger argument of the book, right? That that it's only through expansion. There's no political coalition in the United States. The Jacksonians, the Civil War Coalition, the expansionism of 1898, the New Deal, the uh, the New Right. Every every moment of political progress in in the United States is 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 brought on the back of, of the expansion of national power abroad. Uh, you know, this, you know, white men got the vote through indigenous dispossession. You know, Andrew Jackson, Jacksonian democracy was only possible through moving west. Um, and the war, the, the, the progressive movement of 1898 was predicated on breaking up the Spanish Empire in Cuba and the Philippines. Some suffragists in, the, in, in, in World War I traded their support of the war for Wilson's support of the vote. Uh, and you can go down the line. This is a, this is a country in which, in, which had, in which foreign, the point is that foreign policy, whatever material uh, interests and financial interests it might rebound back to the United States, it's also the realm in which hegemony is established within this country, right? The, the, the ability to expand has been the way domestic politics have been organized. And that's why the current mom moment is such a rupture. You know, the flip side of thinking about the military as a social institution in its own right, in addition to being kind of the the tip of the spear of American presence abroad, is that, you know, especially when we think of the frontier, the idea of vigilantism is, you know, there's either either violence is not sanctioned by the state and being done by private individuals and therefore illegitimate, or in the kind of like Wyatt Earp model, you know, Sometimes the state just can't reach somewhere yet because the the civilization is too new, and therefore, yeah. like a few good men have to hold down the fort until the, you know, until you can build a proper state institution. And what you're showing through, you know, both both in the kind of frontier era nineteenth century and along the border in the late twentieth century is a much more complicated relationship between private violence and state violence. And I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. Well, er, early on, I, and, and again, to start with the higher concept and then move down to the particularities, one strut of American exceptionalism is this notion that the political sphere is separate from the economic sphere, right? That, that the private sphere of property is where virtue is created. And it's the, only, it's the proper role of the state just to protect that realm of individual activity. But expansion entailed an enormous amount of state power, right? I mean, Thomas Jefferson laid out very clear instructions how to lock Native Americans into predatory debt debts and use that debt then to dispossess them of the land in which he could advance a Caucasian democracy. Um, you needed the army to, to remove Native Americans and there was, you know, we know about the one, the Trail of Tears in the 1830s, but, you know, there, there, the 19th century was one 
trail of tears after another, and that entailed an enormous amount of political power. You needed, you needed, you needed the military to create and protect markets. You needed gunboats to create overseas markets. You needed, you know, engineers to lay out, to survey, to irrigate. You know, there was an enormous amount of state power that preceded settlement. Even though, in our mind, a a a, a, a function of a, a sequence of American exceptionalism, and this is something that Frederick Jackson Turner was very important at 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 ideologizing and mythologizing, is that first settlers arrived, uh, then they mix their land with the labor, they mix their labor with the land, and they create property. Then communities form, then communities begin to touch hands, then trust and civil society and commerce begin to develop, and then the state comes. You know that's a, that's a fiction. That's not that's not true. But it's a foundational fiction, and it's a foundational fiction that 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 makes possible this notion that the only right, the only legitimate rights, are private rights, personal rights, not social rights. Um, you know, moving west. You know, the, but the importance of Frederick Jackson Turner and the and the and the Turner thesis is he downplays all of that violence. You know, um, there are other frontier theorists in the. In the, um, in the in the writing at the time, Woodrow other, and two of them who would become president, Woodrow Wilson was an historian, Theodore Roosevelt was an historian, and they celebrated the West as the place that made America. But they sell particularly Roosevelt. Roosevelt wrote a series of books that that celebrated white white Saxon supremacy, militant and triumphant, moving from. Saxon Germany to the British Isles across the Atlantic. He saw the destruction. He wrote that the destruction of the Creeks was one battle in a longer Saxon crusade to bring a bring a certain kind of American freedom to the world. He understood that war and violence was essential to this war against Native Americans, war against nature, but also war against settle his own base instincts. And out of that cauldron emerges the basis of universal law and and that would be the foundation of civilization um you know turner there's none of that in turner and that's what's that's what's so important about turner's frontier theorizing for turner it's commerce i mean turner as a kid growing up in wisconsin witnessed firsthand uh, a violent in removal of the Winnebago's from Wisconsin that his father Chia led from his post running a newspaper, and so so Tur so Turner was Turner you know one I guess could do a psychological reading of the sublimation of, and repression of that memory, um, but setting aside whatever the psychological dimensions of it, it's important. It was very important in the 1890s to begin to deracinate and de-white supremacize the frontier thesis to talk about commerce and law and 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 a, a kind of gentle moving forward through uh civil, through through the creation of public policy you know the united states in the 1890s was about to launch itself into the world it was about to uh, break up the spanish empire in the philippines and in the caribbean take the philippines take Puerto Rico, which has had to this day, take uh, take uh, you know uh, Cuba as a neo-colonial possession for a while, and and this was the beginning of of the emergence of American hegemony, and 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 you couldn't presume to administer the world as if it was the Mexican secession writ large. You know, or as if it was the Louisiana Purchase or Indian Removal writ large. You had to find this was the beginning of a kind of universalism. So people who worked within the Turnarian framework could credibly argue, even if they were honest about the violence entailed with moving forward, that that violence would be left behind, that racism would be left behind as a remnant. That um, as the United States moved forward and became more liberal, more internationalist, more 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 multilateral and more responsible and more universal, so the argument of the book is that even as that's happening, the border, which now is fixed with the Mexican-American War, uh, 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 the, all of the racism and brutalism that that the Turnarians said that the United States was leaving behind was concentrating and festering. And it wasn't disappearing and diluting. It might have been marginalized, and it might have been ignored, but it was still there. And the and and we could talk about how this has happened. But then the argument is, what we're witnessing is the nationalization of of that of that 
violence that had been long been marginalized and 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 relegated to the to the fringes. Right. And so when you're talking about mar- you know marginalization, that's both in you know it, it's a geographic thing. It's for a long time, you know, as you point out in the book, there are a lot of the things that are currently gaining outrage is, you know, Trump administration immigration policies are in fact fairly longstanding practices that were just not, that were ignored for several decades. But it's also, it's also a social thing, right? It's, it's the fraught relationship that, you know, explicit political discourse or polite society has had with the people who are willing to say explicitly that this is, that America is a white Anglo-Saxon nation. Like one of the, the, Turner is only one of the people of the protagonists in your book who's trying to fu- figure out an alternative to that. Like, what is the American character if it's not being defined by this very compelling, very linear Anglo-Saxon, you know, dominance narrative? Um, but one of the things that makes that fraught is that, of course, it's not that it's both contemplating the addition of future sometimes non-white peoples like there's a in the a great moment in the middle of the spanish-american war that you depict where after spain clears the field and the you know na- the nativists the like racist friend realizes the people they're fighting are they're they're fighting to bring brown people into america they're kind of like what what are we doing here why is this um but you know there's th- there's a, a long history that you're identifying of trying to bring non-white people close enough to keep an eye on them, but still excluding them from the polity, you know, in terms of Native American removal, the colonization attempts of African-Americans in the 1900s or in the, in the 19th century. What does thinking about the frontier and the border tell us about that kind of you know, you could call it domestic race relations, but really the idea of a racially diverse America. Yeah, I mean, this is a tension that goes back, you know, right to the to the to the founding. What are you going to do with? I mean, Jefferson, those those early founders and that first run of coastal presidents, they all imagined that the United States would reach the Pacific, but they couldn't figure, and Jefferson talked explicitly about, you know, without a blot on the land, all speaking the same language, you know, you know, understood them as kind of, you know, Saxons to the thousand generation. Um, but they couldn't figure out how to, how to make that happen. Um, you know, there was, there was, there was slavery. There was, um, there was, there was a, a significant degree, increasing large population of, of, of emancipated slaves. There were native Americans. There were, there were Mex- there was Mexico standing in the way, um, you know. There's a great letter from from Madison where late in his life he looks to Spanish America, and says how, maybe we could maybe we could take a look at how Spanish America is dealing with their race problem. I mean, he doesn't he says the peop- the brown the uh, dealing with the red man, you know, because Spanish America passes a, a series of formal constitutions that, despite the exclusions that in practice, at least imagined all people as citizens, you know, all Native Americans, African Americans, freed slaves, you know, and, and then, and then, you know, that's just an example of, of, a, of how much of a conundrum it was for a lot of these early founders. You know, Je- then Andrew Jackson comes along and, and, and he solves the problem by, by just launching what is the beginning of what John Quincy Adams understood as a as a as a as a multi-decade war against the Creeks, against the other Native Americans, against the Mexicans, and onward to the Pacific, and that's how he deal, dealt with it, where the first generation couldn't wed, uh, couldn't reconcile their desire to execution. You know, um, uh, Jackson comes along and 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 is less inhibited, um, but. But there's this tension throughout the whole history of, of, of how to de-Anglo-Saxon society, and it happens in the courts, it happens, the New Deal embraces a quite, a, quite a bit of cultural pluralism. But, but the point of the book is that it's, the Anglo-Saxonism is still brewing, it's even, though, even though it seems like the United States is moving beyond it. So a key moment is World War II, where somebody like 
and, and the creation of what is a new kind of empire, right? And this is, the, this is really the fulfillment and culmination of that Ternarian dream, that the idea that the United States could represent a new kind of world power. That, um, and so somebody like Henry Luce and the American century was a big proponent of that. But there's a great correspondence between Henry Luce and his wife, Claire Booth Luce. Claire Booth Luce was an out-and-out -out Anglo supremacist. And she had a debate with her husband saying, yes, of course the United States should lead the world after World War II. But it should do so on explicitly Anglo-Saxon lines. And she says the front, I mean, this is, this is race realism. The frontier is closed. Resources are limited. And the idea that somehow we're going to preside over a world where everybody can benefit and be race blind is naive. Henry Luce won that argument, at least in the public realm. But that kind of race thinking continued to filter through. I mean, we just read that report about Rupert Murdoch, right? Rupert Murdoch's father was a big, was another one who wanted the world organized along Anglo-Saxon lines. I mean, it was out there, and it was a, it was a strong strand that never went away. And I think that that, that is what we're seeing with the, with the Trump administration. I do want to give us some uh, time for questions, but I, I kind of want to come back to you know you wanted to put a pin in the the idea of the kind of prophetic tradition, which is in the book, it you know something it it's the kind of Old Testament prophets who foresee the doom of the civilization and people don't repent their wicked ways and that doom is in fact you know it comes to pass. So it's but you know there there's also a bit of a framing of here are alternative paths that the U.S. could have taken that it, for whatever reason, chose not to take. Do you think that, you know, is, do you think you're telling a story of alternatives that maybe people should be turning back to and reconsidering or an alternate way to, to an alternate history of America that might help people move forward? Or do you think that it's it's better to stop mining history for the things that we would like to imagine ourselves to have been? No, I think that I think that you could draw lessons from the past without a without a romantic return to the past. I mean, in, in very practical terms, there's you know the. There's two ways of thinking about the hit, hitting limits, right? I mean, and, and Trumpism and the nativism and the race realism and the wall is only one response to the idea that there are limits, that there is decline, that you can't use the promise of endless, forever immortal growth in order to solve domestic problems, that you can't constantly flee into the future, that, you know, that, that there is a, that there is scarcity and the world has to be reorganized in a better way. Trumpism is one response to that, a kind of nativism that says, we, you know, we're full up, <laughs> stay out, <laughs> don't go west, stay out, you know, we're going to, and the wall is, is an, un, is a remarkably apt symbol of that. And it's an apt symbol of that for two reasons. One, it gives the illusion that it's disillusioned. It, it, you know, race realism that the wall represents has the has the sense that it's it's a more honest reflection of the way the world works. Hence, the realism part of race realism, right? Where, you know, not everybody could be saved. You know, lifeboat ethics. You know, you know, we gotta we got you know the people get in the lifeboats and we gotta back the other ones who aren't <laughs> aren't still in the water with the oars to keep them away because only a small amount of people can be saved in a, in a world of limited resources. It 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 it, it pretends to be a more honest. A uh, uh, disenchanted way, and because because ultimately the frontier was a mirage, either dishonestly or disingenuously. It, you know, the U.S. promoted a world in which everybody was going to be benefited, but then it used you know ninety percent of the world's resources and and took umpteenth amount of the world's wealth. You know, it, the 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 old world wasn't this. Did you know the, the the frontier was a myth, and that liberal multilateral order was a, a fiction and a mirage? So there's a there's a there's a danger to think about the the race realism as more honest. But in the book, I talk I I, I say it's it it puts forth its own illusion. It's a way for Trump and people like Trump to talk about capitalism without and talk about the pain of capitalism and the limits of capitalism without actually having to challenge capitalism. Right. It's a way to say that if we just build this world wall, we could continue on the way we are. We can, you know, it, it authorizes uh, 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 um, an extension of a kind of American freedom of as freedom from restraint and, and puts forward the idea that we could keep going on. All we have to do is put up that wall and we could keep going on as we are. And what and what happens with that is just like 
just like ideas of expansion become militarized in dangerous ways, the Madisonian ideal becomes militarized. Um, I, uh, uh, cultural expressions of freedom as freedom from restraint become increasingly cruel. They become, I mean, this is what for me is, I mean, we could burn as much CO2 as we want. We could put people, kids in jail. We could separate from them from the parents. Who's going to tell us that we can't? Who's going to tell us that we can't? That, so there's a there's a there's a there's an illusion that it authorizes a kind of petulant, aggrieved hedonism that is just as delusional as the old order that it sorts to that it seeks to overthrow. Um, I think the other lesson that one can draw from history is that there have been other responses. The point isn't necessarily to go back to the New Deal or go back to the Freedmen's Bureau of the, of the, uh, but to think about these moments that that the U.S. did turn inward and began to attend, and and what why and why a more social democratic ethos didn't emerge from that in an enduring way. Like what were the what were the moments that ultimately led to the unraveling of that more. Uh, of that more kind of honest reckoning with social problems. You know, you could go back to the New Deal, and New Deal was contradictory in its policies, but it put forth a fairly coherent uh, analysis of society that, that took the frontier thesis and used, it at, and, and used it to explain the crisis. You know, FDR was a student of Franklin Delano Rose, uh, uh, Friedrich Jackson Turner, and he was he, he up at Harvard, and I mean, they say that he was he went he skipped that semester and went sailing in the Caribbean, but he must have absorbed some some of this stuff because he would use the frontier thesis to explain the crisis why a nation that did very little regulating had to regulate more. He would he you know it was a, it was it was a way of putting forth the notions of social citizenship and social democracy. So the, there are lessons to draw from the past. It's not a return to the past, but there are at, at the very least just to wrap it down to, to realize there's more than one way to respond to the idea that there are limits and that way doesn't have to be supremacist and and uh, and, and, and 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 based on brutalism and domination uh, so we do have some time for questions uh, as was mentioned earlier if you can use the microphones that are provided here and here uh, that would be ideal so that your voice can be picked up on the recording so um, I was born shortly after World War II, and I remember, I mean, we all thought it was the New Deal and it would just go on and on. And it was an optim in the North, where I lived outside Boston. It was a very optimistic time. The, the, the sense was that there was enough for everyone. And in the 60s, the idea was to expand the, the people to whom the New Deal was, um, was applied. Uh, to, to bring the, the marginalized people into the mainstream. So the blacks. And then I saw it all fall apart starting in 1968. What I can't understand is part of the 50s and the 60s was the immigrant tradition. Um, I mean, you keep talking about white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. Well, there was a time when Catholics weren't considered white. Uh, Irish. Italians, Eastern Europeans, they were all Catholic. Um, and there was, there was um, they weren't accepted at first. There was a lot of pushback. But after two or three generations, they're completely assimilated. And what I don't understand is why people who are only two or three generations away from immigration, from immigrants, who have immigrant grandparents and great-grandparents now, how they've become so anti-immigrant. Um, it, no, it's really strange. And Stephen Miller um, in the White House is Jewish. Um, and he's the most anti-immigrant of all. General Kelly is Boston Irish. Yeah. Um, after World War II, it was a big thing because of the Holocaust, I think. And there was still anti-immigrant sentiment in the country and anti-Semitism anti in the country, World War II notwithstanding. But now, of course, it's much worse. And I don't understand, because we talked about that a lot growing up, how America was a land of immigrants. And that's what made it different and better from the countries of Eastern Europe. 
I mean, those are great questions, and I'm, I'm going to try to refrain because I tend to go on, so I'll try to. Uh, but in terms of your first part, yes, absolutely. The, the post-World War II period was a period of incredible optimism, not least because the, techn because the technology, right. there was technology which underwrote the idea of expand the green revolution, the, the ex rapid expansion of agriculture, which made it people believe that the world could be fed. Right? There was there was the technological basis to support the idea of growing the pie and Keynesian economics and Keynesian and Keynesian economics and the, and the New Deal. It, how it all falls apart is is you know a deal. I deal with both of those things in the book to a degree, but Vietnam right. is not is 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 a, and civil rights a, 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 and civil rights. Um, and then, um, you know, the, 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 the political economy that creates for a more vicious c citizenry among, you know, and, and turns among, you know, I think, you know, you know, the, I think you, you're the, the question, the answers in your question, the Keynesian economics, you know, the New Deal, a cultural pluralism of the New Deal, a, an expanding economy that, that, that imagined a place at the table for, for all people, the, uh, an increasing, uh, uh, a corporate structure that supported the the gradual extension of reform at home uh, are all of the reasons that 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 help explain that moment of generosity and openness that you that you live through and 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 the end of that in the seventies. You know how it all fall apart is is been told in other books, and I try to summarize right, it here. Right, right. Yeah, the but, other thing that I'd point out is when you're talking about the period between the end of the civil or the end of, the, of World War II and 1965, uh, you're talking about a time when the U.S. was still under, as an immigration system, the system of national quotas, which had been written explicitly to preserve white right. Anglo-Saxon right. and Northern German and Northern European immigration. And so there's an argument, and I think it's an interesting one, and not something that. I think, you know, so the debate around immigration is fully grappled with yet that that's why it was possible for the U.S. to kind of identify itself as an immigrant nation, as a nation where, pe where people of various nationalities could come together uh, because there had been these multi-generations of very low immigration and so they could assimilate them. And I don't I think that the question there is, you know, is it a chicken or egg problem? Is it because, is it that you have to tamp down immigration and then people will assimilate? Or is it because the people who were assimilating were people who were already able to get classified as white? Um, you know, it was it the absence of a new immigrant group to polarize politics. And is that really a consent, like a real consensus? That's an open question, but it does lead to an interesting schism in current right politics right now between people who would like to go back to an era of lower immigration because they think it was an engine for assimilation and people who think that there is a meaningful cultural irreducible difference between the people who are immigrating in the early 1900s and the people who are immigrating now. But of course, that's what they thought in the 1900s. Yeah. Right. No, it, it's just the, it's not it, right. there's not a uniformity of opinion there. Hi. Hi. Um, in a note in the book, you mention uh, um, an author, a, a writer named Leon Sampson. Oh, yeah. And um, and particularly kind of his answer to the question, why is there no socialism in the United States? And so I, I was just curious to know more about who to my mind, a, a kind of obscure uh, intellectual from the early 20th century, who he was, how you came across him and what you think about his own uh, thesis and how it inspired, how it, I guess, influenced your, your writing this book. Yeah, Leon Sampson would, had been mentioned by a few people. A lot of people wrote about American exceptionalism in the 1990s, like um, like the, uh, in the 1970s and 80s, uh, Daniel Bell and, uh, and um, Oh, I can't remember. Uh, there's a famous book on about American exceptionalism, and and they uh, Leon Sampson um, was a student. There's not much known about him. Uh, he was kicked out of. He was literally driven out of Columbia, ran out of Columbia by a pro-war mob when he was giving an anti-war speech during World War One. He wrote this incredible book in the 1930s called uh, you know the Unified Front or something like that, and he has an essay about that argues that the reason because. You know, a lot of critical thinkers in the 1920s and 1930s had taken the frontier thesis and and um, and socialized it. Well, there were, you know, Lewis Mumford and a lot of New Deal intellectuals, Stuart Chase, who coined the phrase the New Deal. And, uh, you know, a, a, n a number of thinkers, you know, would 
took the basic premises of Turner that the frontier was this generative thing, but then they looked at all of the re all of the all of the bad things that were generated: a kind of mawkish culture, a, a, a fetish of individualism, um, you know, a, a kind of a, a, a easy resort to violence, um, and and so. But but what's great about Leon Sampson, who nobody knows too much about, the book came out in 1933. He said that um, he said that you know. Uh, he offered, oh, I mean, I'll just read what he offered a wonderfully perverse reading of the frontier thesis to answer the question why there is no socialism in the United States. First off, Samson said, the premise of such a question is wrong. Americans don't have an aversion to socialism. They are socialists. The kind of Americanism produced on the frontier, he said, delivered substantively on all of socialism's promise, promises, where the socialist hearkens to a future of unalienated labor, a time when individuals can be fully human. The American insists, quote, that he is already human, a full-blown, free and final individual. Where the socialist says that the state under equitable economic relations will wither away, the American performs this withering away every day all by himself in kind of these frontier-produced rituals of informality. Hello, Cal. Hello, Al. You know, that you can imagine, like, you know, shaking hands. The American abolishes the state by shaking hands with the statesman. There's not one concept within socialism, the need to overcome the dead hand of the past, the idea that labor is the source of value, a suspicion of bourgeois morality and even class conflict and consciousness that doesn't find what Samson called a substantive counter concept in frontier forged Americanism. I mean, I just included that in because it was it was a kind of one off. It, it made it, it, you know, I don't know anybody else who's who's kind of built on that. Uh, those insights. Uh, he was he was an interesting thinker, that you yeah. know, the idea that that Frank that 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 America is already socialist in yeah. some perverse sublimated way. And kind of hidden in that too, it's kind of a patriarchal socialism too, because you can imagine, you imagine kind of it's a, it's a, it's a, it's socialism for the men of the frontier. Like it's hard to see it for anyone else. Maybe, maybe for families that live on the frontier, yeah. but it, 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 that's kind of hidden in it as well. It seems. So we have time for one more question. If someone wants to hop up. Uh, sure. To, to what extent would you say that the sort of end of the myth is to do with sort of successful anti-colonial struggles? You know, I'm thinking of Vietnam, but sort of more generally, too. Well, it was restored. But Vietnam, I mean, Reagan, Reagan revived the myth, right? He 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 it was a post Vietnam restoration of the idea of more, more, more. Right. Uh, he he came to power. You know, I, I talk in the book about how the New Deal comes to power, talking about limits, you know, but in a way that that is coherent and actually generates a whole political new worldview. But it also goes off the stage talking about limits. Jimmy Carter's Malay's speech, and Carter got you know there were energy prices, the rise the rise of a, a lot of the third world nationalism. But but Reagan Reagan's Resanctification of the mission and 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 restoration of the idea of freedom as freedom from restraint and and restoration of an ideal of individual rights, um, which I talk in different ways in the book, um, was in some ways laying the foundation for a political project that we think that that carried through in successive presidencies from 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 Bush one through Clinton through Bush two through even Obama that that's what's exhausted itself. So you sort of see Reagan as different than what's happening now. Then, I think the Reagan the Reagan restoration is what is what is coming upon, and 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 is what has has hit the hit the wall, in you know in, in its different iterations. <laughs> All right. Well, let's have one more round of applause for our presenters. Thank you.